This story was inspired from this video that was put out by TikTok user Gilchank. The video shows a young guy sitting in his office, working late at night. Out of the blue, a water bottle falls down in front of him. The guy finds it weird, but is really startled when a big computer screen falls down from the rack behind him. Things take a spooky turn when his chair moves on its own. The clock at the reception chimed 12 o'clock. It was midnight. The office was quiet. There was always quiet at night. However, that night, the quiet seemed heavy, like some harbinging evil. I had always hated the graveyard shift. I hated it even more now, one week after an IT guy died. He didn't have any friends in the office. The guy was a loner. The cleaner told us that the guy was under depression, and his wife left him for another man. The guy was working the night shift, and would rarely leave his desk or even the office. Two days after his death, his colleagues claimed to feel a strange presence in the room as they worked. Nobody took them seriously until Derek, the manager, walked into the room and complained of having the same feeling. Immediately, the whole team shifted their systems and started working from home. But my boss was not so benevolent. In spite of what happened, she told me to clock in every night. I really didn't like her behavior, and nor did I like this company's culture, but with the falling market and zooming inflation, I had to obey. It was unfair that most of the time, I was on night shift. However, I just joined here, having only been here a few months, so there was nothing I could do about it. Rather, I willed myself to look on the bright side. I had a job that meant income. I also had great work colleagues. Jeff had celebrated his birthday early that night and asked me to join the festivities. We shared a delicious chocolate cake and cans of soda behind my desk. But now, they were all gone, and it was just me. I took a coffee break, hoping to find someone in the pantry room for a chit-chat, but there was no one. Our office had multiple floors, and it seemed that night that I was the only guy working on my floor. Not sleepy and being in no mood to have coffee alone, I returned to my desk. An hour had gone by and I was deep into my work. Suddenly, a water bottle on Jeff's desk, adjoined with mine, fell down. It was weird, but I didn't think that much about it. I was so busy typing on the keyboard that I must have rammed the keys a bit too hard, resulting in my desk to wobble. I re-replaced the bottle right where it was and continued working. Hardly a minute passed by when one of the monitors on the rack came down. Now I was scared. It might have been or might not have been a ghost, but my boss would probably blame me for the damage. I stood up to pick up the monitor and suddenly my chair moved towards me on its own. That was it. I was 200% sure that it was the ghost of the IT guy. I ran for my life, only to find the main exit to the elevator locked. I kept swiping my card, but nothing happened. Then I heard a loud crash from one of the cubicles. My heart dropped, and suddenly I turned around to look at whatever it was, but I couldn't see any living person. Stark naked fear gripped me hard. It was the primordial sort that reaches deep into your soul. It reached deep into mine and shook my presence. There's no ghost here, I shouted. There's no ghost here. A blur of a dark shadow danced out from the cubicle and sped towards me. It passed my body straight to the exit and vanished. At that moment, I thought I was gonna have a heart attack, but thankfully life had better plans. I remember that I still had the access card in my pocket I swiped once more, and this time, it worked. My mind told me to skip the elevator and take the stairs instead. Yeah, it would be much safer. 20 minutes and 12 floors later, I was out in the open. Cold night air hit me square in the face, slowing me down for a minute. I stopped and took a look back at the front door. 
there was no sign of that thing that chased me out. Still, I turned and kept running until I reached my apartment. The next few hours passed in a rush. I couldn't sleep. I locked my door and laid there in bed, waiting for morning to arrive. I reached the office at 8 and declared to my boss that our office wasn't a safe place to work. I told her about what happened last night. There's a ghost. My boss, Natasha, frowned. There was what? A ghost! It was so scary. You idiot, Natasha said. Ghosts don't exist, and you just want a reason not to work. Your generation sucks. You just want to freeload everywhere. I saw it, I insisted. Natasha left the cabin in anger. I was left alone in the cabin, scared and confused. I walked to my work area to check it out. The computer screen was still on the floor, and my chair was still in the same position it was left in. It was pointless to show Natasha this, and I'm sure after seeing this damage, she would insult me. I decided there and then to resign. I knew I would struggle and would probably need to move back in with my parents for a while, but given the situation, it was the best that I could do. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> My knees could touch the legs of the table, and I could feel the hardness of the wood through my pants. I shuffled a yawn. It wasn't time to yawn, but I couldn't help it. I'd been sitting in the hard chair for two hours, and my butt ached. I itched it to let my hands spread down from the table, but I couldn't. I blinked because I couldn't keep staring at Detective Sally's eyes like she was staring at mine determinately. I sighed and drummed my fingers on the table. It had been two long, agonizing hours in her office. It wasn't a good place. Far from fancy. This office was never on my to-go list. The walls were dull, and so was the ambiance. There was no food, and I was seriously hungry. Detective Sally's eyes trailed to my fingers and back to my face again. So what are you trying to tell me now, Mr. Archer? That I don't know shit about Rachel's death, I retorted. I was aggravated. Spittle spurted from my lips. I was frustrated and sleep deprived. Watch your language, Mr. Archer, please, Detective Sally said with a firm tone. I sighed and wanted to stretch my legs so bad. Let's go through all of this again. Sally tapped her pen on her notepad slowly. You met Rachel at a bar last Friday. She paused so I could acknowledge what she said. I nodded slowly. You had consensual sex. It was a one night stand thing, yeah, I said. Rachel was cute and had a pixie cut, was blonde. Her hair was the first thing that caught my eyes. It shone in the bar's dim lights and I took the stool beside her and ordered a New York lemonade while she ordered an apple teeny. Her voice sounded sensual and soft, like music to my ears. Her lips were red and plump. Her black dress fit perfectly on her slender, curvy body. When the barman came and gave us drinks, he was a scraggly dude with thick, shaggy hair. She picked it up, and I saw her long nails, shiny with red nail paint. I took a sip of my drink, held the liquid in my mouth, and allowed the tangy taste to spread across my tongue before swallowing. She took a sip too. She must have noticed how intently I was staring at her, so she shifted sideways and crossed her legs. Hello, she said. Now I could see her face in full view. I could see how pretty she was. She wasn't that pretty in a generic way. Rachel was pretty in a Rachel way. I saw a lot of beautiful women, but it felt like it was the first time I had seen a beautiful woman. I'm Archer, Archer Bruce. I'm Rachel, she said. No last name, no middle name. She offered none. She was mysterious like that, which intrigued me. I offered to buy her a drink, but she refused, so we both ordered another set of drinks. We didn't talk about ourselves personally. Rather, we picked some random people lounging in the bar and talked about what people they might be. We didn't flirt with words, we flirted with body language. 
We stared each other in the eyes, and she smiled with a treacherously sexy smile. We must have exchanged numbers at some point or not, but it just happened. We had more than enough to drink, and we were borderline drunk. We decided to leave. We staggered out hand in hand into the streets of New York, into the blinding lights of the night. I got us a taxi, and we got in. She lived in a small studio apartment in the Bronx. We made out somewhat passionately on the sofa. She felt soft and sexy. I remember burying my hands in her short pixie blonde hair. We eventually passed out until the next morning. We weren't embarrassed by any sort, but it was my turn to babysit Adriel. We all babysat my sister's kid. Adriel was a nurse and a student. I didn't tell her this as I bolted out while fixing my belt. It was a one-night stand and it was already 10 a.m. I guess that was enough time for a one-night stand dude to leave. So what were you doing with her body? Her dead body in a tiny room hotel at Maplewood in New Jersey, five days later. Look, I said this a couple times and I'm sticking to it. She invited me. She called me and asked me to come over. And when I got there, she was dead. If I killed her, I wouldn't call the cops on myself. Calling the cops to the scene is a popular method we've observed with serial killers like you. I'm not a serial killer. Mr. Archer, we have some evidence. Your watch, your DNA, it's all over the place. Receipts to a credit card issued in your name. What else? I sit back inside. For hours I'd been questioned. And they had all these? I didn't notice my receipts were missing, but my watch. I have no idea how all this got there. I didn't even get to kiss her or have sex with her. Detective Stally stared at me for a while, adjusted her badge and then signaled to the other cops. She was done. She stood with a swift motion and held my gaze for some time before striding out. If I wasn't this deep in this shit, I probably would have found her hot, but she was a cop and I was trying to get my ass out of jail. My brother and sister Tom and Barnett rushed over to me when I walked out. Are you in the clear now? Barnett asked. They found some damning evidence. I don't know how it got there, I replied. What? Tom asked. Some personal stuff. I trailed as I tried to think of the possible ways I must have left them there. We stopped in our tracks, and my siblings gave me a questioning look. They trusted me, and I knew that they were wondering how my receipts got into a hotel room. We all got into Barnett's car. I picked up my phone from my pocket and powered it up. I had no access to my phone since I got arrested for calling the cops to the crime scene and spent hours at that shitty office. Messages flooded in my social media apps. I decided to check my emails first. Then I saw it. Rachel. I knew it was her. Pixiebitch at gmail.com. It was definitely Rachel. Hi, Archer. I'm sorry it had to be you. I wanted to end my shitty life in an interesting way. So I drugged you and had sex with you and took all that stuff that the cops found, including some of your hair. I wasn't sure if I was going to do it before calling you, but I had driven all the way to Maplewood already. So I'm going to pop some pills now and hopefully I'll be dead when you find me and you'll be reading this after your first questionings with the cops. I'm sorry. P.S. Your tongue felt so good on me. P.S.S. The cops will find more evidence. Then the screen went blank, and I couldn't find her mail anymore. Shit! I exclaimed. It was at that point I knew I was fucked. I didn't know what else Rachel had taken from me. The next morning, I was groggy. My head threatened to split in half from the pain that it was writhing in. It felt like a hangover, but... I was just sleep deprived. I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned all night. I couldn't leave New York. I had been told to stay within the city until the investigations were finished. I heard a knock on the door, and then I heard Barnett. Archer. I knew who it was. Detective Sally. Maybe some other cops. They found it. I knew I had to leave immediately. 
I wasn't ready to go to jail for a crime I didn't commit. Isn't this against the law? You can't come in. I heard Barnett shout in her strained voice. I heard Detective Sally burst in, and then we were face to face. She held up a wide rectangular plastic bag with white lacy underwear. Does this look familiar to you? It was the underwear Rachel had worn the first night. I tried to keep a plain face, but Sally was a cop. She must have seen the flicker of recognition in my face. We found it in your trunk, Archer. The game's over. Panicking, I stretched out my hands to be cuffed. Was Rachel really dead? Or was this all a joke? How the hell did Rachel's underwear get into my trunk? It could only mean one thing. It wasn't really a suicide. If it was, the police wouldn't be investigating it. I had been framed for murder, and I didn't have an inkling of how or why I was framed. My phone beat beside me. It was quite early in the morning and I couldn't help but wonder who it could be. It was rare for me to get messages that early. I picked up my phone and the name attached to the message cleared my eyes. I sprang from the bed. It was from my cousin, Gloria. She was texting me to inform me that she would be present for the family reunion. And I literally screamed but paused almost immediately. Gloria had not been to a reunion in two years, and I missed her massively. How couldn't I? She was my favorite of all the cousins, and I was closer to her even more than my siblings. Of course, I was happy that she was coming to the reunion, but the thoughts of what happened the last time she came sifted through my mind like grains through a sieve. The Atlin family reunion was held at my grandpa's estate, as always. This year, the whole family would be getting more time to spend with each other because of the extended weekend, all thanks to the Independence Day. My grandpa's estate was huge. The massive area of land was surrounded by trees and hills. The enormous mansion in the estate itself resembled the hills and its height and the manner in which it was erected in the center of the estate. My siblings and I always loved to go to the reunions, sometimes because of the food and the freedom. The moment of the holiday, free from classes and assignments. Even as we grew older, we came to love our family gatherings. Other times, it was because we got to see our cousins, uncles, and aunts after so many months. My favorite part of the reunion, apart from the trouble Gloria and I got into, was the family dinner. It was beautiful to see tables and chairs set up in the garden and filled with humans chattering and discussing various areas of their lives on the last night of the reunion. The Atwin family was quite a large one, and we lived in various parts of the globe. The yearly reunion was the one time when we all came together. It amazed me that some members still missed it. I could understand if they were in a situation like Gloria's, but they weren't. The last reunion Gloria attended came with a bit of creepiness that neither of us shared with anyone since. Gloria was the adventurous type, unlike me who was introverted. I was easily brought up stage by Gloria because she was my favorite cousin. Being the only same age as I was, I didn't mind. People often said that I'd showcase my wild side whenever I was with her. That year, Gloria insisted that we went hiking on one of those hills. I would have refused, but the idea of climbing and even camping thrilled me. I trusted Gloria enough to go with her. On the second day of the reunion, the two of us disappeared in the afternoon. Our parents were usually worried when the two of us left, while when we were much younger. But because we were older, they didn't even notice that we were missing from the reunions anymore. The good thing was, no matter where we went, we always came back, and that was enough for all of them. The two of us went backpacking, taking pictures along the trail. The day became night, and we found a place to make our tent and set up camp. We ate and drank into the night, talking about college and our boyfriends. When sleep met our eyes, we decided to retire for the night. The next day at the reunion was supposed to be a long day. 
We were barely in for a few minutes when we heard rustling and footsteps outside our tent. Glory and I, stilled in the tent, wondered what could be outside. No one had followed us earlier, and the estate was private land. We were supposed to be the only ones out here. After a few minutes of deliberating and embracing fear, Gloria stepped out first, and I followed sheepishly behind her. Everywhere was quiet again, but right beside our tent was another tent, almost similar to ours. Gloria and I exchanged looks as we took calculated steps towards the new tent. Perhaps one of our other cousins or nieces or nephews decided to camp out like us. Maybe it was one of our uncles or aunts who decided to find out what we were doing out here at night and chose to set up camp. Maybe it was a couple's escapade in the middle of the night. I don't know. Neither of us spoke a word until we were much closer to the tent. Hello? Who's there? Gloria and I took turns saying. When we didn't get any response, we flung open the tent, only to find that it was empty. After searching around with no one in sight, Gloria and I went back to our tent. We concluded that it was probably one of the family members that followed us, but didn't want to be seen or maybe the person went hunting. We slept close to each other in case there was any danger. By the time we woke up at dawn, the tent beside us was gone. Everywhere seemed like it was made for just us, almost as if though no one else was ever there. We took more pictures, packed our bags, and returned to the mansion for the rest of the reunion. Of course, no one noticed our absence or even missed us. And if they did, no one certainly acted like it. Gloria and I completely forgot about the tent we saw during the night. Not until we got back together the next night, after the big family dinner, to edit the pictures that we had taken. It was quite a busy day, but because everyone was returning home the next morning, we decided to edit the pictures and print them. Gloria retrieved the camera from her backpack and inserted the memory card into the PC. As the files loaded up, our blood ran cold, as what we saw was the strangest thing ever. Vivid in every picture that we took, there was a face of a little girl. In the selfie pictures, her head hung in the middle of mine and Gloria. Her face was shining bright with a smile that tore through her ears. When it was a picture of the environment, her head was in front of the camera, staring right into the lens. And when we saw the picture, it was as if though she was staring right at us. Trying to be bold, we attempted to wipe her face off the picture, but she kept appearing over and over. Not in our imaginations, but as real as we were. Gloria quickly deleted the pictures as we were scared out of our wits. Whatever that was, we didn't share it with anyone, and neither did we ever go hiking again. We couldn't even if we wanted to. Gloria couldn't come to the reunion for two years because the girl kept appearing in her dreams. Her parents had sent her to a psychiatric hospital, but that's why I was glad that Gloria was finally coming back.